Shabbat Shalom. So I decided to do a little something different today. Not necessarily speak on the Torah portion, but something else. It's something that I wanted to speak about. Because, hey, you know, I can do what I want. <laughs> That's what I say. You can tell your wife that, yes. It doesn't mean, many times. Doesn't mean that's going to happen, but okay. Um, so I talk about you know Jewish people being chosen. It's, you know, Jewish people we say we're chosen people, but we don't say that. I mean, Bible says that. Bible says Jewish people are chosen people, and a lot of people have problem with that. Unless they say, well, you know, Jews they, you know, brag about it and who choose you and stuff like that. So and and you know. Like being a Jewish person, just to walk around saying I'm chosen, I'm chosen, it's like, you know, <laughs> you can imagine the result you're going to get from that. But and it seems like kind of, you know, not fair, maybe, you know, some people may seem not fair. So everybody wants to be chosen. Like, for some reason, Russia calls themselves some kind of God chosen, holy Russia. Don't know why. Don't know who got it into their heads, but. That's what they say. Um, and the Jews, I mean, we know from Scripture, Jews are chosen and they're called to be light to the nations. And uh, the reason why uh, we're chosen and, and called that, it um, goes to the patriarchs, goes to Abraham. And it says in Isaiah 41, verse 8, it says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, uh, descendant, son of Abraham, my friend, Ahuvi, my beloved, my friend. I took hold of you from the ends of the earth and called you from the uttermost parts and said to you, you're my servant. I have chosen you, not rejected you. Fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I'll strengthen you, surely I will help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand, so on and so forth. That's Isaiah 41. Many other scriptures like that. So it's, it says here that Abraham is a friend of God. We know that. Abraham's called the friend of God. And, and it seems like it's because of that friendship that God had blessed him and chose his people. Because, you know, when you have a friend, you want to do good things for your friend. It's, it's only natural. If you don't do good, good things for your friend, then what kind of friend are you and what kind of friend that person to you? There's no friendship there. So the Jews, are pro uh, they're chosen because of the promise that God made to Abraham. But, but what was so, so special about Abraham? What do we know about him? I mean, God tells him, Lech Lecha, he says, go and go to your land, uh, and I will bless you. Why? I mean, what did he do? <laughs> we don't know anything about him. And the Midrash, you know, fills all the blanks, you know, says Abraham, oh, he like smashed his daddy's idols when he was five years old and all that. So Midrash kind of fills the blank, gives you the reason why God chose Abraham. And there are other things. Abraham was thrown into a fiery furnace in the in the in the Urkazdim that Nimrod threw him into the furnace, and he didn't burn, uh, and and so on and so forth. All these midrashim, of course, they're not literal. Uh, they're there to to make a point, and perhaps there are some there is there are some intertextual connections that cause the sages to come up with these stories. We don't I don't know them. Or maybe, or maybe just uh, to, to give some kind of a rationale for, for the choice. Only Midrash doesn't work that way usually. But what do we know about him? I mean, we know that afterwards, you know, he, he sacrificed. I mean, he was prepared to sacrifice his son. He believed in God. He did all these great things, right? Afterwards. But before, I mean, of course, God chose him. You know, you know God uses precognition. He uses predictive AI behavior, right? I mean, God knows everything that's going to happen, you know, so, so that's, that, that, that's, that's an explanation. But, but it's not a satisfactory explanation because it kind of eliminates all questions whatsoever and kind of short circuits all the, all the questions we may have, you know, throughout our lives and leaves us kind of, okay, fine, you know. Um, but in the narrative, the way the world has been set up, the way it works, there has to be something. There has to be something. Like... We read about Shimshon, you know, he is born and he's that, that great person. What did he do? Well, nothing, but 
perhaps it was his parents and probably mom, by the way, because dad is kind of, kind of dense. If, if you read the story, in the, in the story about Shemshon, dad is kind of dense. So probably mom. And, and so there's something, some kind of a merit of the parents, perhaps. But in the story of Abraham, what do we know? We know just one thing. We know at the end of chapter 11 of Genesis, when uh, in the aftermath of the Tower of Babel and all these generations are listed, talks about Abraham, who is the son of Terach, and Terach has three kids, Abraham, uh, Nahor, and Haran, and they lived in this place, ur in, in some, you know, in, in Mesopotamia somewhere, probably Babylon, probably close to where the tower used to be. Um, and that, that uh, Haran, he died there in ur -Kazdim. Uh, it seems like Haran is the, is the, is the uh, um, youngest child of Terach because he is listed as, uh, in, in order, he's listed third. Perhaps he's, he's, uh, he's the youngest one. And he has a kid. He has Lot. He already is married and had a kid. So it all happened kind of quickly. He was kind of probably very young when he got married. And people of that age, who, who knows how old they were when they got married? You know, maybe even 13 or 14. It's also possible. You know, you have teenager, you know, kids having kids. Today, I mean, it's possible biologically. Perhaps it was, that, was, that was the case there as well. You don't know. We don't, we don't, we're not told, but young, right? And, and, and when he dies in ur Kazdim, what happened is that Abraham and Nahor, the brothers, they take wives. It's like the next verse over, like he dies and they take wives. So it seems like them taking wives have something to do with, with their brother dying. Otherwise, why would the scripture put it together topically that way? And usually you, 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 take, <laughs> you, you take wives, you know, to have children. At that time, you know, taking a wife was not just a... You know, it, 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 was, it was a strategic thing to do. It was a, fa it was a family planning, the, 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 usual, the, the right way family planning should be. Family planning is to have kids, not to not to have kids. Um, so <laughs> they, they, play, they, they were planning the, some kind of, to fill the gap that, that, that was created by the death of their younger brother because the death of a younger child, that just doesn't happen. It's not right. Like, it's not right than that the kids died before their parents. It's like there, there was a, a story of a, a Japanese emperor who asked one of his servants, write me a formula of happiness. And he came, thought about it, came back with something he read. It says, your father died, uh, you will die, your kid will die. It's like, how's that happiness? It says, yes, it is. And God forbid the order is reversed. Um, so that's, that's, that's a horrible thing, right, to, to, to have your kid die. And, and, and it also, it's like, you know, in the ancient world, people saw these things. They saw them all as signs. It probably was some kind of a sign for, for something. You got you to fill the gap. You have to have more kids. So apparently they were sprung into action to, to fill the gap and have more kids. Because the next thing we know, it says specifically Sarah was barren. And Sarah was barren. That's what we know about Abraham before he even goes to before he even goes to uh, the land of Israel. And, and actually, it's not even Abraham who starts going to the land of Israel. It's Terah, his dad. We know from the scripture, it's Terah who took the family to go to the land of Canaan, but he just stopped on the way. He got stuck. He got stuck in a place called Haran. An interesting Haran. We heard that somewhere, right? That's the name of his son, right? So, what, he found the city that's named after his son accidentally? He said, I had a kid, he named it Haran, he passed away, let's go. Oh, here's a city called Haran, let's stay here. You think the city was called that already, or he called that city that? He, pro he perhaps uh, opted to call a place Haran and said, okay, I'm okay here, I'm not going to go there, this is it. You know, I'm going to, I was going to land of Canaan, but... Eh. I can actually establish some kind of a lost legacy for my kid here. Because what kids mean, kids, they mean legacy. Kids mean legacy. And one way to establish it is somehow name, name a place that way. I mean, it's something, right? And apparently he was, he was satisfied with that and he stayed. And Abraham... He was not satisfied with that solution. 
And it's not just, it's not just uh, <coughs> Terach who was satisfied with that. Nahor was also satisfied with that because this is when Nahor stayed also. Because this is where Abraham then sent Eliezer to get the wife for uh, his son Isaac. This is where, where Jacob went to get the wife, the wife for himself as well. That's the place where all these wives came from, from Haran. This is where Levan used to live. You know, Levan, who was the son of Nahor. And so they, they stayed all there. It's just Abraham who went forward. He went forward. He was not satisfied with that particular solution. He wanted to continue to go to the land of Canaan to inherit the land of Canaan for whatever reasons that are beyond the scope of this sermon. There may be reasons why Canaan it has to do with Noah and his sons and all the kind of things and the blessing that was sons of Shem have received and not the sons of Ham and not, not Canaan in particular. But anyhow, but Abraham went forward. He was 75 when he went forward. And he went forward to when he was obedient to God. And then, and then God says this about Abraham. In Genesis 19, 16, when he, after he is visited by the, by the angels and he is given the prophecy that Sarah will have a kid. You will have that child that's promised. And it's not Ishmael. It's going to be Sarah's son. Right? And in Genesis 16, when the men got up from there and looked down over, the, over Sodom, Abraham was walking with them and sent them off. And Lord said, should I keep secret from Abraham of what I'm going to do? Seeing that Abraham will most certainly become a great and mighty nation. And in him, all nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have made myself known to him so that he will command his sons, his children, his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. Something that was absent in Sodom. You know, sin of Sodom, contrary to popular belief, was not, was not homosexuality. It was part of it, but it wasn't the main one. The main one was absence of righteousness and justice. And as Abraham was contrasted to Sodom, Abraham will do it righteous and justice that Sodom doesn't. So that Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. By the way, Sodom, where a descendant of, the, of Haran who died, Lot, he went to Sodom of all places. So, you know, the legacy had to be in a, in a different way. It has to be through the son of Abraham. So... God chose Abraham because he will command his children. And this choice, this choice, first time the word choice appears in the Bible, it's in the context of taking wives. Uh, it's when the, the fallen angels decided to come and take wives for themselves from the women of the humans. It's a very mysterious thing. How that was possible, I have no idea. Somehow, they figured it out. They figured it out, they cut the cord, right? And they came and they have uh, became human form beings and had wives. And this is what it says, Genesis 6.1. It says, when the mankind began to multiply in the face of the ground, the daughters were born to them. Then the sons of God, the angels, saw that the daughters of men were good and they, were, and they took for themselves wives as any they choose. That's the first time the word choice appears in the Bible. Like the, when, when God chose Abraham. But this is when the first time choice appears. When these angels they took for themselves wives that they choose. Lord says, my, And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with, with humankind forever since their flesh. So that their days be 120 years. So that was the direct result of, these, of this, of this uh, thing. That the angels came and took the wives. The direct result said, Oh, no, you can't do that. So I'm going to cut, you know, I'm going to. Gives you, give, you know, cut your lives, basically. <laughs> the Nephilim were on earth in those days, and also afterwards, whenever the sons of God came to daughters of men and gave birth to them, those are mighty men of God, men of renown, but in, in Hebrew it says the, the name of the, the people of the name, or, or the, the men of the name, like renown. They had a name for themselves. These, these Nephilim, these giants, they had a name. They had some kind of a you know, stature to themselves that they could, you know, possess. And it's interesting, you know, so, so they chose the wives, those angels, they chose the wife for the sake of having children. And, and it's, and, and the next generation after and the flood came about, wiped this whole thing out. God said, no, that's not way, not way to do it. I'm going to wipe this place clean because you guys infested it with giants, right? Um, 
that you know they're not <laughs> they're like they're invasive species. They're they're not they're not supposed to be here. And by the way, also giants invaded the land of Canaan. There were also invasive species over there. You know, they had to be wiped out from Canaan as well. So, you know, giants are not a, not a they're not gentle. <laughs> um, so they, and it, but the next generation of the builders of the tower, you know, they understood that they cannot live that long, that their name will not endure, so they want to make the name for themselves through the building of the tower. They said, make ourselves, let's make ourselves a name, and they built a tower. They chose a, a building as a legacy for themselves, just like perhaps Terach chose the place of the city as a legacy for his kid. You know, that was, that was their, their, their approach, is somehow establish the legacy doesn't go away through buildings, through something permanent, through real estate, something that's permanent, right? And, and God said, no, this is not the plan. It's going to be other plan. It's not going to work this way, because legacy comes from the children, and not the children that live forever like those gigantic children of the giants. It's going to be children that actually do the commandments of God, that follow after God, that are going to observe righteousness and justice. That's what makes legacy. Observance of righteousness and justice are not your physical size or physical strength. So God chose Abraham and Sarah. He chose this couple as an alternative to the tower to make the disciples to... After, you know, to, to, to establish his legacy on the land. And he chose Abraham because what? Because Abraham showed a desire to not to settle for real estate legacy. <laughs> he showed a desire to, to, to produce disciples. And therefore, that was after God's heart. And, he, and then he, of course, believed after all the promises God had gave him. But that was, that was perhaps the, uh, the impetus for God to choose Abraham because he, he demonstrated him being different from all the people of the earth who, who were just caught up in this paranoia of building towers and naming cities by the names of their kids. But also Abraham believed. He believed in God, and it considered to him righteousness. But what did it mean practically? You know, if God reveals himself to you, why wouldn't you believe also? What's, what's such a big deal? You know, God revealed himself to Abraham and said, I'm God. I'm going to give you all this. And Abraham said, okay. And somebody said, now I'm believing. I don't know who you are. Let's go away. You know, who would say that? Um, but then there is this famous passage uh, from Book of James, uh, that you know later, which this Jew-hating Luther later in life didn't like. It's uh, James chapter two, verse eighteen. It says, "Well, from eighteen says, if so, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith by my works. You believe God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But do you want to know, you empty person?" That faith without works is dead. Wasn't Abraham our father proved righteousness by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith worked together with the works and by works that his faith was made complete. The scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a man is proved righteous by works and not by faith alone. That was Luther's slogan, by faith alone. Well, no. <laughs> it's contrary to the scripture. Can't do that. So Abraham then proved his faith through the work by sacrificing his son, this legacy that he was building. It's not just the son that he sacrificed. Please understand. There's a lot of children's sacrifices in the in, 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 in ancient world. They sacrificed kids left and right. I mean, look at Aztecs or whatever, you know. It, was, it wasn't a big deal, you know. It, I, mean, it was, I mean, it was, but, but at the same time, it was not uncommon. That's what I want to say. But here is not just the kid. It's the legacy that, that, that everything depended upon. It's, this, it, it's, it's like burning up the, everything you, you know. Wow, of, course, of course, he believes God. He believes God. He believes that God will raise him from the dead. That's why he did it. He didn't do it 
without hope saying, okay, I'm going to do it and it'll be, it'll be another, another Isaac. No, it'll be this Isaac, God will raise him from the dead. I don't know how God will do it because I believe in that. that well, that's how faith was proven. It was faith in the resurrection of the dead. It was faith that God will make it work. That, that was the faith. That was the faith through, through the works that, that actually proven Abraham in the end. But, but in the beginning, God chose him because he was his friend. Yeshua said to his disciples, he says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. No one, greater, no, no one has greater love than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. You, my friends, if you do what I command you, I'm, so it's not just friends. It's friends condition. <laughs> you're friends, but you have to do what he commands. If you don't do what he commands, you're not his friends. We're not his friends if we don't do what he commands. I'm no longer calling you servants. <laughs> you know, he calls Yaakov servant, he calls Israel servant, and Yeshua does not call us servants in this case. And at the same time, we know from the disciples' letters, somebody, when they wrote, says, Paul, the servant of Yeshua, the Messiah. So, you know, okay, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't, right? But here, I'm no longer calling you servants. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. Now I've called you friends because everything I have heard from my father I had made known to you. That sounds familiar. That's from Abraham. Would I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? That God, he's called a friend of God. He's not hiding from Abraham what he's about to do. And Yeshua also is not going to hide from his friends what he's about to do. You did not choose me. I chose you. I selected you so that you would do and make produce fruit and your fruit would remain. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This thing I command you so you may love one another. So Yeshua chose his disciples so that they will establish his legacy by being fruitful and making other disciples. Because children are equivalent to disciples. Children in the Bible is synonymous to disciples. They have children of prophets. It's not like all these prophets had a lot of children, right? The children of prophets means students of prophets, means disciples of prophets. So in this case, children means disciples. And Yeshua chose his disciples so they can establish his legacy. What is his legacy? His legacy is to love one another like he loved us. His legacy is love. That's, the, that's what he had bequeathed to us is the love that lays down the life for the friends that's the legacy of Yeshua and that's why he chose us as disciples to advance his legacy Paul says in Ephesians 5 8 says once you're darkness but now in union with the Lord you are light walk as children of light children <laughs> for the fruit of light which is children of light, fruit of light, is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them, for it is disgraceful even to mention the things that are done by them in secret, yet everything exposed by the light being made visible, for everything made visible is light. That is why I say, wake up, a sleeper, rise from the dead, and Messiah will shine upon you. Remember light. Light. <laughs> That's the purpose of being chosen. Is to be the light to the nations. Israel is chosen to be the light or, or goyim. That's the, that's the purpose of Israel. To be or goyim. To be light to the nations. Light is to show what God's intention and legacy is. And it is only in union with the Messiah that Israel becomes light to the nations, just as Paul said. Because in union with the Lord, you are light. It's only in union with the Lord we are light. Only in union with the Mashiach can Israel be the light to the nations. Without union with the Mashiach, Israel is, is, a, is a menorah that's not lit. It's the menorah, has no light. With union in the Mashiach, it has to be lit up. 
to be that light of the nation. Without, without, it is impossible to fulfill the Torah for Israel without believing that the one whom Lord have sent. And he says, Paul says, in the, this is why it says, wake up, sleep, arise from the dead, and Messiah will shine upon you. That's a quote from, from Isaiah. Isaiah 60, it says, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen on you. He substitutes Mashiach for Yud Hevavche. Paul substitutes. For behold, dar that's, that's why we know that the name that's given to Mashiach is Yud Hevavche, is, is the, is the four-letter name of God. It's, not, it's not, not the only scripture like that, but it's just one of those that shows that. For behold, darkness covers the earth, deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you. His glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light. Kings to the brilliance of your rising. Lift up your eyes and look all around. They all gather to come to you. Your sons will come from the far away. Your daughters carried on the hip. Then you will see, be radiant, and your heart will throb with swells with joy. For the abundance of the sea will turn over to you. The wealth of nations will come to you. Multitude of camels will, co will, will cover you. Young camels of Midian Ephah, those with Sheba will come. They'll bring gold and frankincense and proclaim the praises of the Lord. That's the result of Israel being the light to the nations. Of course, Mashiach is the light of the world, as he said, I'm the light of the world. The one who walks in darkness, the one who believes in me will not walk in darkness, will have the light of life. That says Yeshua, Mashiach is the light of the world. But at the same time, he gives his own light to his friends. He gives his, you know, Mashiach is, is he, he's been cut up in heaven. Where is he? He is here. He is here in us that we can be his light, that we can carry his light to those around us. This is what he has left us. This is the legacy that we carry. It's the light that, me, that, that shows itself as love to one another. Without the Mashiach, there is no legacy, no light, and there's no fruit. Without the Mashiach, Israel is barren. So it is up to us to be the light to the people of Israel and to show love to one another like Yeshua did and fulfill his commandments, being his friends whom he chose. So therefore, it's not just Israel who are chosen people. Think about it, the implication. It's the dream come true for everyone who says we're also are chosen. But it says here, 1 Peter 2, 9, says, You are chosen people. Who is he talking to? You are chosen people, royal priests, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people. Well, he's not talking to just the Jewish people here. Because Jewish people were a people. But he says, you are not a people. He quotes Isaiah, but he misquotes it. He uh, Hosea, he quotes Hosea, but he specifically misquotes it. Because Hosea, is, is when he marries a prostitute, he's, he's said to call uh, his, one of his kids Lo Ami, not my people, right? And then next, in the next chapter, he says, call him Ami, my people, right? But here it says, not, he doesn't say not, not a people, not my people. It says, not a people. So he specifically misquotes it. But now you're God's people. You were shown no mercy, Loru Hama. <laughs> but now you have been shown mercy. So he does, quotes, he does quote Hosea, but he misquotes it specifically to show that he speaks this not just to the Jewish people only, but to everyone whom Messiah have called to be his friends. Friendship of the Mashiach is not limited to the Jews. <clears throat> now, Jews are firstborn child. That is true. It does say, Bni Bechori Israel, my son, my firstborn Israel. So, yes, Jews are the firstborn people. And yes, Jews were given a double portion. They have all these advantages, as written in Romans chapter 3. They, Jews do have advantages. We do, yes. But at the same time, where it comes to friendship of the Lord, there is no advantage. Friends are friends. Friends are those that do commandments of the Lord. Friends, it doesn't depend on your national origin. It depends where you do commandments of the Lord to love one another as he loved you or not. Who believe God and do the work that he commanded. This is how we are children of Abraham as well, by faith. Not through national origin. 
So yes, there is specialness to the Jewish people in terms of them being a firstborn of the nation. But at the same time, God is extending his friendship and his, his light, his love, to all who are willing to obey his commandments and to love one another and to be the light. So where is the boasting? It is excluded. <laughs> That's, I think, what Paul meant when he was saying, where is the boasting? It's excluded. It is excluded by the law of, by, by, by you know, the grace of the Lord who extends his um, love to all who are willing. That's all I have today. And I pray, Father, that we will be directed to love one another, to be the friends of Mashiach, and we will know what needs to be done in order to establish the legacy of Mashiach in the world that's around us, to proclaim the message of Mashiach through the hearts of the Jewish people, to show what it, is, what it really means to be a disciple of Yeshua, and to be God's chosen people, to be the light to the nations, to be the light to the world. And we pray, Father, because it is written to those who want to be cleansed, they are helped. That we will receive help from heaven in all these endeavors. We pray for speedy salvation of Israel. Just as it's written, all Israel shall be saved. We thank you, Father, and bless you. In Yeshua's name. Amen.